Falls, oops, sorry, Cascade Falls, which is about uh, at the end of a hike. The trailhead is about 20 minutes from my house. And so there we are on earth. Um, on the other side, you see the Venera 13 landing site from Venus. The point here is both of these planets would be categorized as within the habitable zone of our star. And yet one of them has liquid water on the surface and the other one has a surface temperature that's about the same as the self-cleaning mode on your oven. So we need to understand more about planetary evolution and how these planets differentiated if we're going to understand about habitability. All right. And for those of you in the room who are younger than me, and that's probably most of you, um, you may not realize that we used to go to Venus a lot, right? We go to Mars all the time now. We have lots of assets on Mars. But we had a number of missions on Venus. Uh, Mariner 2 was the first mission to fly by a planet, uh, flew by Venus. It didn't have a camera because, in the words of Carl Sagan, the scientists in the room who were making these decisions thought that a camera was pandering to the public, razzle-dazzle, kind of stuff that couldn't answer one well-posed scientific question, right? You know, it took till Mariner 10 before we really could understand the cloud cover on Venus and, uh, and see what that is looking like. Mariner 10 was the mission that went to Mercury, flew by Venus on the way to get there. So, um, most missions, the last U.S. mission was Magellan in 1990, which is probably before some of you in this room were born, which is kind of a sobering statement for the rest of us. And um, we have gotten some information from missions that use Venus for gravitational assist. It turns out to sometimes be favorable to go toward the inner solar system, gain speed, use gravitational assist from Venus to get to the outer solar system. And so this is how uh, some of the other missions have uh, found their way to collecting Venus information. I wanna introduce you to an observation that I think is, is highly underrated. Okay, we have three landing sites uh, where we have rock information from the surface of Venus, all right? And from those three that only lasted about an hour on the surface of the planet, um, we're able to take a spectra of the rock and determine the composition. And from the composition, geologists can tell between from the ratio of magnesium to iron, what the temperature was that that lava equilibrated with the interior of the planet. And those temperatures are plotted here along with associated air bars. This is typical ocean floor. Geologists would call it mid-ocean ridge basalt, but basically you can think of it as anywhere that you would see ocean floor, this is the rock that you would see. Um, and that's distinguished from lavas from ocean islands such as Hawaii, which would plot uh, in this range, depending on the range of uh, all the islands that you might look at. The point is, Two of these plots, and perhaps Vega, which may be a little, little bit high, fall at the same temperature as Earth. That means whatever's happened on Venus, whatever has happened on Earth, today, both interiors are at almost the same temperature. I'm going to show you that that is not at all what I would expect. Okay? We're gonna start with Earth and Venus at about four and a half billion years ago. 
I'm going to leave kind of a vague timeline and a vague temperature scale on here because that's not really important. Um, but they both formed about 4.6 billion years ago. Um, we have them both today with lavas at essentially the same temperature. And however they got there, they're putting out lavas that are in this range. Ocean island basalts are at a higher temperature. There's a kind of rock that only appears early in the earth record that's at an even higher temperature that's thought to be from early in the earth when the interior of the earth was hotter. Um, this kind of rock, cometeite, is, uh, would be plotting up here. That's what I would think might be more applicable to Venus. However they started, both planets presumably formed from the same stuff at the same time by the same process. So they both started very hot. And however they've evolved over that four and a half billion years, they're kind of at the same point now. And this is, to me, very surprising because we don't know much about the history of these. In fact, we don't even know on Earth. It sort of depends on which geologist you want to believe. Um, but there's an argument by Mark Harrison that's been picked up by Craig O'Neill that says that the zircons, which are found in the very oldest rocks on Earth, could only have formed in the presence of water. Therefore, water was stable at the surface of the Earth, and he's got an argument that that means plate tectonics had to exist way back then. Mike Brown at Maryland says, no, no, no. He looks at metamorphic rocks. He says, I see nothing that looks like a subduction zone before two and a half billion years ago. So I don't think plate tectonics could have started before then. Bob Stern is an even younger age, so we don't even know when plate tectonics started on Earth. We know Venus didn't have plate tectonics, but again, the interior temperatures today are much the same. Surface age of Venus is also young. So both of these things are sitting here today. How do we know the surface age of Venus, right? We know Earth because we have radiogenic uh, nuclides. We can measure rocks and get their ages from that. We know the moon because we have Apollo samples. Every other body in the solar system, we have to do this by counting craters. This is every crater on the surface of Venus that's been seen by the Magellan radar, down to at least five kilometers in, in radius, 932 of them, right? That compares with the moon, which has at least 100,000, some people argue a million craters, and those craters fall off in a district, well, did it again. Those craters fall off in a distribution where you're looking at the crater size. Here are smaller craters, here are larger craters. It's a log-log plot, and this is a cumulative distribution. This distribution is exactly what the planetary scientists expect because it matches the distribution of asteroids in the asteroid belt. It says something about the uh, impact uh, if asteroids are the result of, uh, or impacts are the result of these asteroids, then the asteroid distribution and the impact record should uh, match. You can do something similar on Mars. You've got hundreds of thousands of craters on Mars, and they have a very similar distribution. The figure that I the paper that I stole this from actually had the distribution in a much wider um, format. And so I just consolidated it so that the slope looked the same as you see it there. But again, a distribution and number of craters on Mars, on the moon are ex exceptional compared to what we see on Venus. 
you might argue, well, Venus, we know it has a thick atmosphere. So, you know, maybe these craters burn up on entry into the, the asteroids burn up on entry into the atmosphere. They never make it to the ground. You factor that in, this 900 is still exceptional. And it comes up to a assessment by the people who look at crater impact that there are somewhere between the age of the surface of Venus is somewhere between 250 and 750 million years old. And that you cannot to tell statistically whether this surface is one uniform age or whether this surface has been resurfaced by a number of volcanic episodes such that its average is 250. The data are simply not good enough to resolve these two. And so when you have an absence of data and you have modelers, they can fight no end without coming to a conclusion. And for the longest time, in fact, there has been a two models that the community has settled on. One of these is a global resurfacing event. And because it happens, remember this is thinking about geologists. So this happens on a short time, geologically speaking, could be millions of years, but still from a geology point of view, a short time, it sort of took on the name catastrophic resurfacing, right? If you want to get published in nature, it happens to be a good idea to put your, uh, make things sound a little bit more uh, dire or whatever. And there's a continuous resurfacing. Essentially, you imagine that hot spots like Hawaii are outpouring a lot of volcanism because of the high surface temperature. Those lavas remain hot and they're runny and they run out across a long area of the surface. And if you have enough of these things, you can kind of resurface the whole planet over a period of time. And so these two bottles have existed um, with a certain amount of friction uh, between the protagonists of each model. And frankly, we're not going to resolve them until we get more data. There's a couple of NASA missions that are upcoming that should hopefully get some more data that I might talk about uh, at the end. But I want to remind you of something that uh, those of you who've talked with Julian Lohman certainly know about, talk about stagnant lid convection. The idea that if a planet has a thick, high dense, uh, thick, high viscosity lithosphere, this planet basically uh, in this high viscosity part of it has a linear temperature gradient, behaves almost like conduction, because the heat can't simply get out. With plate tectonics, you're moving things around, new material comes to the surface, it cools, that cold material goes down in subduction zones, that heat mechanism cools off the planet much more efficiently than a stagnant lid planet. And so in this particular case, and here I've non-dimensionalized everything so that this is the surface of the planet. Uh, I think this particular case is from my Mercury work and it really doesn't matter because Mercury has a very thin silicate mantle, but from our purposes, we're only, only worried about the lid. What you can see in the RMS velocities, this is a three-dimensional model, which I have, um, uh, showing you the velocity as a function of radius um, averaged over each radial shell in the surface of the sphere, you can see that the velocities are zero. Um, they increase linearly. They're kind of the average velocity is in the same throughout the interior. Temperature structure sort of looks like this. Again, an averaged one-dimensional temperature structure. 
you have a conductive lid and you have a convective region underneath it. Stagnant lid convection became popular in the mid 1990s, um, but I'll point out that it was actually a paper in 1982 that showed that convection organizes itself such that there is about an order of magnitude change in viscosity in this bottom layer and all the rest of it is in the top, right? This is what a stagnant lid looks like. This is another 3D calculation. This is two 3D spherical calculations, which I have paint, you know, took hours and hours and hours of computer time to run. And I'm showing you a single average temperature of the interior as a function of time. So I'm throwing away 99.9% .9 of the data and showing you how the time um, evolution of the model goes. Everything else in these models is identical, except one has a stagnant lid and one has a mobile lid, not plate tectonics, but it has a lid that's able to deform. There's radiogenic heating here that decays as a function of time, sort of like it does in uh, expected in a planet. There's a cooling core boundary condition in this model. So the core and the mantle are actually coupled together. The core is actually being solved by a one dimensional ODE as, as an overly simplified problem, but it basically allows me to um, cool that bottom boundary condition in a, a, a semi energetically realistic way. And in these two models, you can see the stagnant lid is a lot hotter than the mobile lid. That is why I say that that observation from the Vega, uh, from the Venera 13 and 14 sites is so amazing. Earth and Venus, however things are going, Venus is in a stagnant lid now. We know it's been resurfaced. We don't know exactly how but they're both at roughly the same internal temperature today. That's not what I would expect as a geodynamicist. So let's go back and let's think about this global catastrophic resurfacing mechanism. An awful lot of people have worked on this over the years. In geodynamics speak, I might call this a stagnant lid convection calculation with punctuated events that appear to be mobile. And I want to look at a number of models, or I'm going to look at, at one model in particular. And the question I want to think about is, if we imagine taking all that cold stuff that was at the surface that was cooling conductively um, in equilibrium with space, and now we put all that cold stuff and we stuff it down into the interior of the planet, particularly at one location, we're going to create a mass anomaly. We're going to create a wobble in the planet. And what does that look like? So geologists don't like equations. So I've come up with a haiku, um, incompressible momentum conservation energy balance um, that solves, uh, that explains the equations we use. It doesn't really matter. These are the general equations that most people in geodynamics would use for this kind of modeling. We're doing this in a three-dimensional sphere. We have conductive or we have radiogenic elements in our material. That radiogenic, because once something decays, it's no longer available to produce heat. So the radiogenic element heating should decay with time through the age of the solar system. Um, we have a pretty good idea of what that is, and so we can input that into our model. Like I said, we have a cooling core boundary condition. So whereas in 
traditional fluid mechanics, we like to hold everything constant and vary only one thing. In planets, planets are cooling down with time. And so we have a balance that basically says, um, you know, the amount of heat that the core can get out of the planet is controlled by what the mantle will let it get out. And the higher the mantle temperature is, the less heat flow there is between the core and the mantle. As the core cools, the core could um, solidify. That solidification would create latent heat that we have to account for. And so this energy balance takes care of that and uh, deals with the um, one-dimensional heat uh, at the core mantle boundary. Not doing a three-dimensional core model, that's a, an outrageously expensive thing to do. We also have temperature and stress-dependent rheology in our mantle. This is based on mantle rock um, the little samples that people measure at high pressure, we hold our breath and cross our fingers and hope that these little samples are representative of what happens at the scale of kilometers. Um, don't worry much about the picture. I just put it there so there was something pretty to look at. But what I do that's different, so far, everything I've shown you is pretty much 2020 standard geodynamics modeling that most people would use. One of the things that I looked at that was different was the pattern of the initial temperature. And the argument has always been, this is a vigorously convecting fluid, Four and a half billion years is a long time. It has no memory of the initial conditions, right? I'm going to show you that may be a bit optimistic. I'm amazed um, at how much that affected. So we use spherical harmonics. I know in physics, you're used to thinking about spherical harmonics with quantum mechanics. We're just using this for a pattern, right? And I'm looking at one partic two particular cases today. Uh, one case that has one hemisphere hotter than the other, and these are small perturbations. The interior of the planet is about 2,000 degrees Kelvin. We're talking about a 20-degree perturbation. I would imagine that that would just diffuse away and we'd be done with this. However, as you'll see, that's not the case. So spherical harmonic degree one essentially is anti-symmetric, anti-podal, right? One hemisphere is hotter, one hemisphere is colder. Buoyant hemisphere is going to want to go up, the dense hemisphere is going to want to sink, right? So we'll look at that case first. And I'm looking at, you know, what do we do with models? Um, you know, how do we know that the models are correct? I'm looking at a whole bunch of things. I look at the geoid, which is a perturbation from the large scale gravitational potential. And that kind of tells me where the hot and cold areas within the body are. I look at the topography that is generated by the upwellings and downwellings. So this is something that, um, Russ, uh, Russ looks at, this is something that Julian looks at. And so this is a pretty standard sort of, of thing. We want to essentially have explain this young surface age. We know that Venus doesn't have a magnetic field and the energy of core dynamics tells us if there's too much heat flow coming out of the core, the core is too active, we would generate a dynamo. And a theoretical work says that's about 20 milliwatts per meter squared. If, if you're ever on Jeopardy and they ask you that, you're welcome. So, you know, it's important for me. It, 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 it's a constraint for you guys. Um, another thing that we're looking at is this 
variation, essentially this wobble, the variation between the center of mass and the center of figure. And I'm gonna show you a little bit um, exactly what I mean by that. Center of figure of a body is essentially the, 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 the center of the, uh, the, the body itself, right? In a spherically symmetric, perfectly spherical body, that's, you know, R equals zero, right? Center of mass and center of figure agree. Planets aren't exactly spherical. They're oblate spheres due to the rotation. We, Venus doesn't rotate very much, so it's less oblate than some other things, but um, we won't worry about that too much at this point, but this is something we can calculate. If you imagine that I put some dense stuff on one side of the planet, if I don't change the sphere, the center of figure is at the same place, but now because I've added some mass, and of course, wherever there's an anvil, there's a coyote, so um, I've moved the mass, I've changed the center of mass, right? So that just gives you a sense of what this measurement is. And we know this for planets, so it's about three kilometers for Mars, uh, it's about two kilometers for the moon, and similar for Earth, it's 200 meters for Venus. Venus is pretty radially symmetric compared to other planets. Um, and that's something that we looked at. Here is um, the geoid of Venus, and here's the topography of Venus. Ishtar Terra in the Northern Hemisphere is the highest topographic point um almost 10 kilometers it's if if you were to think of where might there be something like a continent on venus this would be the place right but it's not clear um because we can only look at things in radar on venus and we can only see roughness it's not really clear what the whether this is compositionally the same or different from um, these other materials, but you can see visually very easily that there's a pretty strong correlation between the geoid and the topography on Venus. Everywhere there's a geoid high, and this is minus 60 to 120 meters. Um, this is the highest uh, points in the geoid. These are the highest points in the topography. The topography, Venus is remarkably flat for planets. That's another sort of, you know, a huge amount, something like 80% of the surface of Venus is within plus or minus 500 meters of the mean elevation, right? We don't have water, so there's no sea level, so we have to divine some sort of mean elevation, right? It's the positive correlation between geoid and topography that I'm going to look at. So I want to show you the first case of uh, models. We'll think about it in terms of these different observations in a, uh, a few minutes when we look at the case. And I will point out that any other odd harmonic that I choose, any other anti-symmetric case that I use, evolves along a similar lines to the ones that I'm showing you. And this is fairly representative of what happens in this particular case. So you're gonna see a couple of figures like this. There's the pattern again. Remember, this is plus or minus 20 degrees out of 2000. So like 0.1% difference in temperature. This viscosity structure as a function of depth is what gives me the positive correlation between geoid and topography. That's a whole nother talk. Uh, we won't really get into that. But top line, first of all, all of these things going across, time is in millions of years. So this is calculation basically runs for twice the age of the solar system. Right. This would be 
time zero when uh, the planets formed. Uh, four and a half would be roughly here, but the age I'm not particularly worried about other than in a general sense. Top figure, I show two curves. One of these curves, uh, let's see which one, black, is mobility. Mobility is essentially the RMS average of the surface velocity divided by the RMS average of the interior. Stagnant lid mobility ought to be zero, right? And so in fact, what you see is for the first few billion years of this calculation, it's roughly zero. It jumps up to something greater than one. Essentially the lithosphere is moving faster than anything in the interior. That's when this overturn is happening. And then it goes back into pretty much a stagnant lid case. The red lines are there to give you a, an estimate of the velocity. Um, it's in, on the order of 10 millimeters a year. Geologists who study plates on Earth like millimeters a year, even though we're all told and we all tell our students, thou shalt publish in CGS. Um, we use millimeters a year because it gives us numbers like between zero and 100, and that makes us feel good that we don't have to have these wacky numbers. Here's the core mantle boundary heat flux, and what you can see is every time you go into one of these periods of mobile lid, all of a sudden the heat flow at the core mantle boundary shoots up like crazy. That's because you're basically taking all that cold material putting it down at the bottom of the, at the boundary between the mantle and the core, and the core, it's just sucking the heat out of the core, right? This is large enough to drive a dynamo, and you can see that it lasts for over a billion years. And you can do a back of the envelope calculation, and you can say, if I stuff all that lithosphere stuff down and it cools by conduction, how long would it take to cool? And the, the cooling age on average is something like 500 million to a billion years. So this time scale makes a lot of sense. But the key point is this model can't possibly be Venus because if 250 million years ago, all this lithosphere went down into the earth um, to the core mantle boundary, we would have a dynamo on Venus. That's what this model is telling us. Also, if we look at the bottom, this is the center of mass center of figure offset as a function of time. It starts out at two kilometers and it quickly goes to like 12 kilometers. So this is a very asymmetric planet. And you can see this if you look in the geoid and the topography. And this was what really surprised me, right? This is a map of the geoid from one particular time slice, 500 million years after the start of this initial condition. You see these stable configurations of highs, um, which are essentially, as I'll show you, upwelling plumes from the interior of this thing. And you can see, particularly in the topography, um, you don't see it so much in gravity because gravity removes the degree one spherical harmonic term by definition. Um, so that doesn't look as asymmetric, but you can see the asymmetry hotter in this hemisphere, colder in this hemisphere. Here, you don't see the plumes anymore, but you still see this hemispheric asymmetry existing for 2 billion years. This is not what a geodynamicist thinks is going to be happening. And so for other reasons, you know, for reasons because we don't see this kind of asymmetry, this doesn't look like Venus at all. So this model is a pretty much a failure. This is, if you look at um, this image confuses a lot of people. Um, I look at it every day, and so I'm like, what's to possibly be confusing about it? Uh, 
what you're seeing are some slices through the interior of the model that are showing you the temperature structure um, along that slice and kind of in three dimensions. And then you're seeing a surface of constant temperature that sort of shows you in the three dimensional structure where the plumes are. So this is useful for me because I like to see how thick this boundary layer is. And I like to see all these little drips going on here. And there is a lot of other stuff going on in this model, but these plumes are really predominant and they stay predominant until you hit at least 2 billion years. This is what happens right before the beginning of the overturn and it's just a mess. And I'm, you know, I leave it to anybody to try and sort out exactly what's going on um, at that point. Let's quickly look at the uh, case that might be relevant to this other mechanism. And one of the questions here is, okay, hotspots on Earth um, have, and this is ocean bathymetry where I've removed the dominant effect, which is as you move away from the ridge, the ocean floor cools, cools like conductive square root of age, and so I've removed that so that we can look at anomalous material and it's not the best figure, but it's the one I had access to when I was putting this together. You can see these traps, right? First year geology classes talk about hotspot tracks in the ocean, right? And they happen because the plume is relatively stationary. The plate is moving over it and the volcanism basically comes up through and you get a volcanic chain on like that. Venus doesn't have plate tectonics, but the question is these hotspots do move, they move slower than the plate, but they move a little bit relative to each other. Why don't we see anything like that, right? This is emissivity. There are very few windows through the Venus atmosphere, but there is one window in the infrared that basically allows us to look at the surface of Venus. And you can either interpret this as compositionally distinct material or material that's warmer or colder. And the general interpretation is this material is warmer it's a topographic high. People think of this as a hotspot volcano um, that indicates that Venus has been erupted, you know, sometime within the last thousand, several thousand years or something like that. Why don't we see any kind of evidence of motion of these sorts of things? Here I used... Actually, I, I think I said eight six here. Here's what I actually used was eight four. It's a, it's basically a checkerboard of up and down wellings as my starting condition. And my assumption was, again, this would smooth itself out and the convection would do whatever it wanted to do. The reality is, and here you're looking at an animation through time of the geoid and the topography. And what you can see is even after a billion years, this pattern is still there. Eventually it morphs into a pattern that's sort of a cubic pattern, and then it continues to morph um, through uh, several other patterns. When I first saw this, I could not believe that this continued to exist. I spent weeks going through the code thinking there must be some overprinting of my initial condition. And um, eventually I convinced myself that's not the case. And there's a particular reason why the geoid is really good at picking these things out. Because if you imagine a cylinder of hot rock, 
And the geoid is basically an integral from the bottom to the top of the buoyancy. So if you have a cylinder of hot rock, that's going to constructively build up as you integrate and give you an, a, a large gravity anomaly. If I have random blobs here and here and here that are of opposite signs, some of these blobs are um, dense, some of these blobs are buoyant, but they don't go all the way through the planet, essentially they're going to average out when I do that integral. And so the geoid is a really great way to find coherent vertical structures through, um, through the planet. So again, I'm going to just show you a couple of snapshots. 500 million years, here's the pattern, here's the pattern. Uh, almost 2 billion years. I could not believe this when I saw this. I was like, this is not at all what I would expect. Here again, if we look at um, an isosurface, you can see those plumes at 500 million years. When I first started looking at what was going on at the later time, I said, aha, I've got a problem. But then I want you to sort of look at, I've got an 18 or a 2490 isotherm here, a 2510, so I've raised the isotherm by 20 degrees. You can start to see some structures in here. And I've sort of taken everything off of the top so that you don't actually see the top. But there they are. The stinkers are still there. Helps if I maybe point them out to you. Those plumes are even within that messy structure. And this is one of the things that helped me to see why other people who've done this kind of calculation before might not have seen this before. Because it's really hard to pull things out of these three-dimensional calculations. Here's the time series plot. In this case, I only ran it for four and a half billion years. Um, the entire time, it's in stagnant lid convection. Other than maybe for the first billion years, the heat flow out of the core is incredibly low. Um, almost a uniform core mantle boundary temperature and a very small center of mass, center of figure offset of the planet. So I have not shown that I can produce the amount of melt that I would need in order to resurface the surface, but I have the other conditions here that look to be right. If you'll indulge me for a few seconds, there's a fluid dynamic reason I think that that particular pattern is um, something that the convection holds on to. People have worked for a long time, and you can go back, you can find this in Chandrasekhar's book, on stable patterns in spherical convection. And a tetrahedron, Geologists know what this is because they think of silicon tetrahedra all the time, but uh, imagine a, a, a three-dimensional pyramid um, with a plume at each uh, vertex of the pyramid. A tetrahedron is a stable pattern. There's a cubic stable pattern. There is a Sphere, dodecahedral, which turns out to be spherical harmonic degree six, order five. And Fritz Busse, who is a German um, physicist who worked on these things as well, published a paper, and there's a line in his paper where he said, the highest order I can prove is degree six, five. But I think I see evidence that there's a degree eight, six stable pattern in there. And by dumb luck, 
my initial condition happened to basically hit that stable pattern. So what I think is happening in here is once energy gets into one of these modes, it's hard to get that energy out of the mode. That energy wants to stay. That mode is a preferable energetic state for this thing. And as the calculation cools down, it's cooling down from the 8.6 through the 6.5 to the cubic. And if you actually look at this thing, one, two, three, four, and then the two poles, there's the cubic. If you look at the blue um, patterns, as it's cooling down, it goes through and the energy cascades into these different stable states. And once it's in there, it tends to want to stay in there. And so I think that is what we're seeing and happen in this case. It particularly comes up in these kind of stagnant lid calculations or these lithosphere calculations, because if you imagine this hot material, and this might be ET or it might be a confused geophysicist, um, this hot material comes up as it interacts with the core mantle boundary, it basically creates a divot or a cavity in that, or sorry, core mantle boundary, that lithosphere. It heats up that lithosphere, creates a, a thinning um, that basically stabilizes that plume. When I did similar runs, except I didn't make that lithosphere temperature dependent, I only made it strong function of pressure, what would happen is these plumes would wander around by Brownian motion because essentially the drip over here would, you know, drag the plume this way and then uh, something over here would drag it this way and it would wander around like what we anticipated to happen. So it's the particular interplay of the lithosphere and, and that is important in this stabilization. So. I call these surprisingly stationary plumes. What makes them stationary? That's the lithosphere. Um, some of you may be saying, I don't study Venus. Why should I care about any of this? And my argument is whether or not Venus is has or ever has had this kind of plume, we need to know something about um, the stationarity and the evolution of this system. Now, I'm going to try and very quickly jump through in one minute, Corona, because this gets to the machine learning and is kind of the fun part of this. Corona are these unique structures on Venus. You see them in radar. And what you're actually seeing in radar are rough regions. They're always circular. They're ring fractures. There is nothing like them on Earth. They're unique to Venus, and there are a lot of them. There's over 300 of them. And so my student, Grant, started looking at these things, and he used a machine learning, we didn't realize it was machine learning at the time. We were just looking for ways to see whether these things are clustered or not. And it turns out, we happened on this algorithm, and same algorithm that's used underlying in a lot of machine learning algorithms, you know, to basically say, if you like John Grisham and you like John Le Carre, you know, then you're likable to like this other book or whatever, right? Some kind of clustering. Amazon uses it, Google uses it, I'm sure many people use it in various form. We used it on, started, said, let's use this on Earth first. We think we know hot spots on Earth. And we think we know that some of them are related to each other. And so what happens if we try and use this clustering algorithm? And in particular, 
there's a group of hotspots in the southwestern Pacific that always cluster together. The algorithm knows nothing except their location. It doesn't know that geophysicists want them to be clustered together uh, for other dynamical reasons. It doesn't know anything about their lavas or anything. They're just clustered. Turns out we said, okay, what happens if maybe this is just dumb luck? Let's create 500 random distributions on the sphere. Um, this is what the clustering pattern, the search radius as a function of number of clusters found. This is what you should get. This is what the Earth is. It's significantly different from random. Not by a huge amount, but enough that you can tell it's different. Here's the corona on Venus. And here are the clusters that we find. And those clusters line up in such a way that uh, here I've overlain this degree eight, six pattern. Overlays with this pattern. And it's led to us to think about this idea where these stationary plumes come up, interact with the lithosphere, but then we get small scale plumes and plumelets off of the top of these stationary plumes that form corona. It's actually an idea that has been applied to that very cluster that I showed you of hotspots on Earth uh, by Vincent Cordio, uh, who argued that there's a very big structure in the lower mantle that essentially births a number of smaller features off of it and leads to this. So we know corona aren't randomly distributed. Maybe we need more than one driving mechanism or so forth, but when and how did Venus resurfacing begin, right? Back to the beginning of my talk. Um, Venus, I would argue, has likely always been resurfacing. I think that there are these stable modes that a stagnant lid planet like Venus is able to get in, uh, and it has been continuously resurfacing. I would further argue that this global resurfacing event was highly unlikely. There's some implications for this, but I will leave you with the words of Marty Gilmore who is a professor of geology at Wesleyan, and she's one of the people on one of the NASA mission teams. She says, Venus is an Earth-sized planet, and now who knew? There are Earth-sized planets all over the galaxy. That's what people are telling us from the exoplanet studies. So now Venus is even more relevant um, for this reason. So I say, let's go explore. I'll stop there.